my story's just begun Yeah, failure won't define me Cause that's what my father does No, failure won't define me Cause that's what my father does
Father God, you are great, powerful, mighty, and you move among us, Lord. We invite you into this place as we enter into our time of communion, our time of quiet. God, come and be among us and move among us in a powerful way. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please have a seat, and on your way down, grab the elements of communion and the cup holders in front of you. This is our moment. Every week, we just pause, take a breath, and think about the great and mighty love that our Father has for us. His mercy that's new. His love that runs so deep. It really blows me away when I pause and think about it. How precious that gift is. How deeply he cares that he would come here, become flesh and blood, and die for us. Love us so much that he 
removes our sin from us as far as the east is from the west. And that while we were still sinners, Christ came. It just blows my mind when I think about that love so great, that flow so precious, that act so selfless. And I just want you to take a few moments remembering all that he's done for us and knowing that whether or not you feel close to him, you feel far away from him, he's still right there with arms outstretched, wanting to be near you, wanting to show you how much he loves you. It's just truly amazing. So wrestle with the pull taps, get to the bread and the juice, symbols of his body and his blood. Just take a moment with Jesus. Go ahead and take a communion. forgiveness flowing down from where the Savior died the Son of Man upon the tree exchanging death for life see him there in innocence the body and the blood behold the King Crucified, spotless lamb of God. Oh, the precious love of Jesus. Oh, the fount of grace divine. Flowing as a mighty river. Washing sinners in its tide. There will never be.
Thank you, Jesus, for all your many, many gifts. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you that while we were still sinners, you came and died to remove our sin, our shame, our inequity, to bridge the gap, to bring us closer to you through your great and mighty love. Lord, thank you for that flow that washes us white as snow. Thank you. We pray all of these things in the most powerful, the most precious name above every other name. Jesus, we pray these things in your name. Amen. Good morning. Hey, here in our Loveland campus, out at Fayetteville, online, around the country, and listen to this. Uh, in India, Belize, Egypt, Pakistan, Philippines, United Kingdom, Jordan, Mexico, Nigeria, and more, welcome to River Hills today. We're glad you are worshiping with us. Hey, there are blessings to be had when God's people to get together. Isn't that true? And we expect those blessings today. Now, before we jump into the message, I have a couple of housekeeping pieces to take care of. First of all, we've sent out giving statements electronically, but we've discovered some of you didn't receive them. So if we didn't have a correct email address, or if you'd prefer to have your giving statement in a print form, would you let us know? You can give them a note at guest services, or you can email tracy at riverhillcc.com, and we'll see that you get your giving statement. We usually provide these digitally. If you want another form, that's fine. Just let us know. And I want to give you a brief update. Our Israel experience coming up in November, we have 32 spots guaranteed for the lowest price. 20 of them have been taken. So if you want to jump in, uh, now's a good time. We welcome you. It'll be a great trip, and uh, you can find out more on our website uh, with a link to the trip. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being here today. Today we begin a new series of teachings called Relation Slips. Did it ever occur to you that life is relationships? And sometimes in our relational life, we slip up, or am I the only one that's ever done that? We make mistakes that make relationships, rather than being healthy, they become something less than healthy, and we suffer as a consequence. In fact, to help you get into the spirit of this, I'm gonna take a little risk here today, and I'm going to ask you a question. It's not just a rhetorical question. I actually want you to turn to somebody near you and have the guts enough to just share two or three top of mind adjectives. What adjectives best describe your family, okay? There'll be all kinds of adjectives. So there's no right or wrong answer. Just what's the first thing that comes to mind? Go, 10 seconds, go. Talk to one another. <laughs> Okay, well, that worked a little better than I thought because I don't see any fist fights breaking out. That's good. I mean, what adjectives describe your family? It could be all kinds of adjectives. I hope your adjectives are things like happy and healthy and thriving. I hope that describes your family. You know, might say my family's a, a traditional family or my family's a blended family or I'm part of a single family household. Maybe you, you, you think, well, my family, if you're really gutsy, you say my family's dysfunctional, right? I mean, there might be one or two of those represented in a group this size. I mean, maybe we all come from dysfunctional families, I think, but there you go. I mean, what adjective describes your family? I, I know this, no matter what adjective you use to describe where you are relationally in your, in your family life, we all want better relationships. Isn't that true? And, and better relationships matter, but I'm also convinced that our relational life, our family life, 
has never been more under assault and attack than it is right now. Remember after 9-11, Homeland Security came out with this chart that, uh, you know, what's the threat level, <laughs> you know? I've never seen it be anything but elevated, that yellow slice in the middle. I've never seen it be blue or green. I'm not saying it hasn't been. I just don't remember. But that, that's the, the, the threat of a terrorist attack in our, our nation. But let me tell you something. I think for every relational life, for every family, I think pretty much we live in that threatened category. There are lots of things that come to attack our relationships, things that come to put our families at risk. And in this series, we want to look at how we can reduce the threat level, how we can gain some skills, how we can recover from inevitable relation slips, because we're all going to mess up from time to time. In fact, I think there are mistakes that we make that harm our relational life, things like not communicating well. Anybody ever struggle to communicate clearly? Uh, things like not actually living out an authentic faith life in, in our home and our, our day-to-day -day life. Things like, yeah, we, we all have expectations of one another. What do we do when those expectations aren't met? What do we, how do we deal with the disappointment that inevitably, inevitably comes from relationships? Things like the busyness of this world and the pressure society constantly places on us to conform to, to maybe the kinds of practices that really shouldn't have any part of our lives as as followers of Jesus. In fact, this matters so much. I, if you don't believe me, how about, how about listening to Dr. Mark Schultz? For years, he was on the staff of the Harvard Medical School. Pretty sharp guy. Now he's still at Harvard, but he's leading a longitudinal study about relationships, about family life, about individual happiness that's been going on for 84 years. It's the longest study of its kind ever. They've been tracking people now into the third generation, tracking what kinds of choices people make, what contributes to personal happiness. In fact, he's written a book about it called The Good Life with another uh, physician friend, and, and just revealing some of the things they've discovered. Now, what makes for happiness, do you think, in life? Everybody wants to be happy. Is it a successful career? Is it a good income? Now, those things obviously help in any circumstance, but, but that's not the real key to happiness. It's not socioeconomic level. It's not education. It's none of those things. In fact, after 84 years of research, one thing is obvious. Mark Schultz says it like this. Relationships are the key to a healthy human thriving. If you want to thrive, if you want to be happy, nothing matters more than your relational life. I mean, that's how important this is. Now, it took them 84 years to figure out what I figured out by reading the Bible in one minute. Where, where Jesus said, love one another. Where, where Jesus said, what does it matter if you gain the whole world and lose your own soul? But I think we need to understand today just how important our relational life is. If you want to be healthy, if you want to be happy, paying attention to your relationships, nothing matters more. So today I want to talk to you about what I think is a, a big threat to our relational well-being, and, and that's how we communicate. In fact, if you don't communicate well, that's a, that puts your family at risk. That put, puts any relationship at risk, but I think especially our family. In, in fact, I'm convinced that in our relational life, nothing is a bigger challenge than how we communicate with one another. That communication really, really matters, and that we ought to work hard at being better communicators. In fact, this is so important that the wisest man who ever lived, remember him, Solomon, son of David? He said this in the Proverbs. He said, reliable communication permits what? Progress. When we communicate well, things get better, not worse. When we don't communicate well, the opposite is likely to happen. But communication is not easy. In fact, I wish I could tell you today, I'm going to give you some biblical principles, and I wish here are three easy principles that will guarantee great communication in your relational life. I can't do that. Now, what I can give you is three biblical principles that are really sometimes hard and challenging to live out. But if you live them out, if you work at them, I promise you your relational life, your relational health will, will strengthen. Your relational uh, health will grow. But uh, I don't want you to think this is easy because I don't think anything we do is harder than communicating. Uh, in fact, I think good family communication, good relational communication is always a hard work challenge. So today, I want to lay before you three biblical principles, three hard work challenges, and if you'll go to work on these things, 
I think you'll find that relation slips, the inevitable mess-ups that we make, can be overcome. We can recover from those and be healthier moving forward. The first challenge is this. I want to encourage you to work hard to listen and to understand. Work hard to listen and to understand. Now, the goal of all, under, of all listening is understanding, but, but it's hard to listen. I think it's even harder to understand an, another person. But this matters so much that Peter had this to say to husbands. So men, this is from God to you. This is from God to me. This is for men. If you are married, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. And I know some of you are instantly thinking, that's impossible. You don't know my wife. I mean, I get it. Understanding is hard work for any of us, but it's the challenge God lays before us to work hard to understand one another. And where does it begin? Where does understanding begin? There is no understanding without what? First, hearing, without listening to another person. Now, question, how many of you ever went to school? Did anybody here go to school? I mean, hopefully every hand goes up. That's a kind of universal experience here in our culture. And, and, you know, 12 years, kind of mandatory education. Most of us have probably gone beyond that. And in school, I'll be honest, there were modes of communication we had to study. So starting in the first grade, I had training about writing. First, how to form the letters, make sentences. Starting in the first grade, every year I had to write. In fact, it didn't end after 12 years. I had instruction on writing on into college, on into grad school, on into post-grad work. You know, I mean, writing is an important thing. Usually there's 12 years of formal training. Do you know how much time we spend communicating writing? 9%. Not very much, but lots of formal education. How, how about reading? You know, we typically have six to eight years of formal reading training. Mine went on to that. In college, I had to take a class called How to Read a Book. Anybody remember that? How to Read College, How to Read. You know, 16% of our time is spent reading for communication. Speaking. You know, I had no formal education in my first 12 years with regard to speaking. Now, I had some training but it happened in the extracurricular world. It happened in 4-H, it happened at church, where I had some training in, in how to speak. Now, and we spent about 30% of our time speaking. But do you know what we do most of our lives? Listen. About 45% of our communication time is spent listening. How much formal education did I have on listening? Probably the same amount you did, none. I mean, you chart it out, it looks like this. Most of our communication effort happens with listening, our activity, and yet we have very little training, if any, on how to listen well to another human being. So I have a question for you today, and it's a, a self-reflective question. Are you listening to the people in your life? And how well do you listen to the people in your life? There's a book with that title, Are You Listening? And the authors, Nichols and Stevens, say this, the effectiveness of the spoken word hinges not so much on how people talk, but mostly on how they listen. Do you know what that means? My sermon will only be good if you listen to it well. I'm off the hook. I mean, seriously, we communication begins with listening well. Paul Tillich said, if you love somebody, do you know what your first duty, your first obligation to somebody you love is? Tillich says the, the first duty of love is to listen. Do you listen to your husband? Do you listen to your wife? Do you listen to your kids, your grandkids, your aunts, your uncles, even that crazy cousin you'd rather not see? I mean, how well do you listen? Howard Hendricks taught communications for years at Dallas Seminary. He said the principle of listening is to develop a big ear rather than a big mouth. Good counsel, right? Speak less, listen more. Somebody said God gave us two ears and one mouth and that ought to mean that we listen twice as much as we speak. Listening is hard work. In fact, it is so vital that, that James, the brother of Jesus, gives us this challenge. He says, my dear brothers and sisters, be quick to what? Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. In fact, it's when we talk a lot without listening a lot that we usually get in trouble. You know, I can't remember I, I can't remember really getting in trouble much for anything I didn't say. <laughs> now, have I gotten in trouble for stuff I have said? Yeah, you better believe it. Here's what, again, Solomon said it like this. When words are many, sin is not absent. Boy, isn't that true? When we 
just kind of go on and on. Sometimes we mess up big time. But he who holds his tongue is wise. And what can we do when we're not speaking? We can listen. And it's a hard thing to do, really hard thing to do. So I want to challenge you to go to work and become a better listener in your relational life. At home, in your, in your friendships, listen more and talk less. And not just with your ears, the challenge to listen well involves your eyes and your heart as well. Because a lot of communication is what? Nonverbal. We need to work hard to understand more than the words that are being spoken. In fact, you've probably seen this, that 10% of communication is content, the words, 55% body language, and 35% tone. So 10% content, 90% nonverbal intent. Now, it's easy enough to demonstrate. Uh, I, I'm going to show you right now how important watching and measuring tone is. So, for example, I can say, great. I can say, great. Or, great. Now, I've said the exact same word three times, but three very different messages. And you won't pick that up if you're not listening with your eyes and your heart as well as your ears. And when you do that, you'll discover that when people communicate with you, they're talking about their needs. And I'm going to tell you something about everybody that walked in the door today, and every, especially every first-time person I've ever met that comes to visit a church. Do you, know, do you know what they're thinking? Will anybody care for me here? Can I connect here? Will, will, will someone be a friend to me here? Can, will somebody listen to me and know me here? And the same is true in your family. Every person in your family needs to be recognized and heard, to be valued, to be truly appreciated and loved and respected. Yes, to be understood. And do you know what we all need? We all need a safe place to share our needs, our burdens, our heartaches, and ask for help. In relationships that are healthy, we bear one another's burdens. We are willing to listen and, 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 and hear the, the cry of, of hearts that are hurting and then do what we can. If it's nothing more than to be there to make a difference. Every family needs good listening skills. So here's one of the things I've learned to make sure I'm, I'm, I'm listening well and understanding. You need to learn to hear, understand, and then restate what has said and felt. Now, let me give you an example for this. Sometimes Teresa will say to me, Jeff, take out the garbage. And I will say back to her, Teresa, I heard you say, Jeff, take out the garbage. Did I get that right? Yeah, you're pretty sharp, Jeff. Okay, Teresa, what I didn't hear is, Jeff, take out the garbage. Does that mean now, or is that a time of my choosing? That, yeah, and I have to work hard to figure that out, you know. But uh, the way I get there is by asking, did I get that right? Do you want me to take the garbage out now? No, you can do it anytime you want. Oh, okay, thank you. Pressure's off. I mean, it's really important to listen and to restate what you're hearing and then to ask the clarifying question, did I get that right? And then you'll get affirmation or you'll go to work again. I mean, it's so important to develop some of these skills, and they are skills. They're learned behaviors that help us cultivate our family life, that help us cultivate our relational life. Because remember, Solomon said it. He said, reliable communication permits what? Progress. Things get better relationally when we work at communicating reliably, when we develop our communication skill sets. There's uh, another hard work challenge we face. And that is, all of us make mistakes. We have relation slips when it comes to our communication, and those slip-ups can be killers. So I think we need to work hard to eliminate the communication killers. That, uh, haven't you been in a conversation when suddenly something was said and instantly everything shuts down? I mean, it's like flipping a switch. The, the conversation, the communication is just over. It's done. It's dead. And usually, I think those conversation killers involve the word or the, the prefix dis. You know, if you heard somebody say, don't dis me, don't dis me, don't dis me. Now, when it comes to conversation killers, and we've all, we've all done them, I'm pretty sure of that, 
you know, we try to explain away poor communication. We try to explain away. So that was just the way I was raised. That's how my mom and dad uh, communicated. I mean, I was raised in a dysfunctional family. And maybe you're thinking that now. Boy, you've got some obstacles to overcome. My guess is that's true for all of us. But I want you to take inventory and look and see if you've been guilty of any of these conversation killers in your relational life, in your family, in your friendships. Things like disrespect, don't diss me, dishonor, disregard, you disgust me, dismissal, get, get out of here, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna turtle, I'm gonna disengage with you. Are you dis, dissing people? Disrespect, what is that? Well, you disrespect somebody when you judge them, when you criticize them, when you, when you belittle them and call them names, when you, you're constantly diagnosing them, trying to fix them, when you use sarcasm. I mean, that, that's all that's disrespect. Those are communication killers. You dishonor someone if you're ordering them around and treating like you're better than they are, when you're threatening them or, or you're moralizing, you know, trying to tell them how to live their lives, when you're asking excessive questions that demonstrates you don't trust, when you're constantly advising because you think they'll never get life right. I mean, all those, maybe not intended to be, but those are dishonoring conversation killers. Disregard, when you divert attention away from what somebody really wants to talk about. You know, I'm a, I'm a man, I can do this with great skill. Teresa wants to talk about something, and eh, let's talk about this instead. I mean, that, that's disregard. Uh, by lo logicking the conversation to death, by, by reassuring behavior. I mean, disgust and dismissal and disengagement, turtling, running away. I mean, look at your own life. If you have been guilty of any of these behaviors, ask the Holy Spirit to help you root them out and to replace them with healthier communication habits. And you might say, okay, this is hard, Jeff, because this is how I was raised. It's our way. It's, it's, it's what I know. And believe me, I get it. I grew up in a, a culture in Kentucky where men did not communicate very well, where they didn't speak much and they didn't listen much. They hardly engaged at all. I had to overcome a lot of my heritage. Now, listen, your past may be a great explanation for why you communicate the way you do. But listen, do you understand that an exclamation is not an excuse? That we have no excuse for dissing people. And so the Holy Spirit today is challenging us to learn a new way, to ruthlessly recognize and eliminate the conversation killers that can wreak havoc in our relational life, that can destroy our family harmony and love. And there's one final challenge today that I'll put out there for communication, and, and that is, when it comes to communicating better, it's your turn, right? I mean, be proactive. We have to work hard to say, this is my issue. I have to work on this. I have to make time to both learn to be a better communicator and then actually invest in communicating with the people I care about. So cultivate an it's my move attitude in your life. I have to work at this. I have to do this. I have to engage. And I want to challenge you to, to make this a big priority because, listen, we live in a turbulent world where families and individuals, where relationships are under attack. This is one of my favorite pictures. It's about 30 years old. It's a guy standing in a lighthouse with a big wave coming, you know. And now this guy was interviewed about 10 years after this picture was taken say, how'd you survive? How didn't you get washed out to sea with that crashing wave over the lighthouse? He said, when I saw the water coming, I jumped back inside and slammed the door shut. I mean, and that's what, what our relational life ought to be, a place where we can jump to safety, a place where we can slam the door shut so the, the storms of life don't, don't destroy us and wash us away. Is that the truth about your relational life, your family life? your friendships. Remember, the key to a happy, thriving life is the quality of your relationships. Jesus said, love one another. And that won't happen without investment, without communication. Now, this has changed a little bit, and I'll tell you how, but Newsweek uh, regularly does some survey about communication habits. And they, did, they revealed a few years ago that the, that the average couple talks to one another alone four minutes a day, four minutes a day. And that same couple will spend 47 hours a week in front of screens. Now, that's how it's changed. It's not just TV, it's screens now. It's 
social media, it's streaming, it's, it's all kinds of stuff. Now, can you really have the healthiest relationship possible if you're investing 30 minutes of conversation, communication in your marriage? 30 minutes with your kids, your, your parents? I mean, we just have to prioritize this. We have to take time to communicate one another. And it's a challenge. Now, listen, it pays dividends. Again, let me give you an example. You know, Teresa's been convalescing from her surgery, and I've been out doing my stuff. And, you know, Teresa, she loves me. She wants to know what's going on in my life, and she likes it when I talk to her. But I'm a guy. I don't like to talk. You know, recently, I, I had a day where I had to go talk uh, with a, you know, I was making a presentation for a bunch of pastors, and then I was doing stuff in, in the office, and Teresa had gone to the doctor. And I know she likes, she likes to know what I'm doing. And, and so here's what I did. I came home, and without her even asking, I said, honey, come sit by me on the couch. I want to tell you what I've done today. And I told her everything I'd done. I even had a PowerPoint. Can you believe it? I mean, I went through the stuff I'd been doing and showed her everything I was doing. And, and I said, now, you had to go to the doctor. Tell me about your day. And we spent 30 minutes on the couch just talking to one another and just reviewing, you know, what we'd done that day. And it was like I had to work at it. But you know how profitable that was? How that made her feel? How that feeling that she exhibited blessed me? I mean, it's worth it to invest in one another with your family, with your friends. So I want to give you a challenge this week, okay? Let's make this real. What can you do, you know, what can you do to, to increase communication chances in your family? How about just unplugging and having dinner together once a week? You know, just listen to one another. No, no, no phones, no screens, no TV. You're at the dinner table and at the meal... Whoever's in your family, if it's a husband and wife, it's the kids, whoever, just at least once a week, we're going to unplug and we're going to look at one another and we're going to converse. We're going to ask questions. We're going to listen. We're going to connect. I mean, that's a challenge. It really is. It's, it's a challenge. You can do this with your friends. If you're not married, you say, hey, let's, let's go out to, to lunch. Let's, let's spend some time. I mean, you have to prioritize this. You have to invest in it. Uh, Oprah Winfrey is, you know, I mean, the great social scientist that she is, got this one right. She said, okay, now, I know you're going to hear from people, we don't have time. We don't have time to do this. But if you don't have time for one night or at least one hour during the week where everybody can come together as a family, then family is not a priority. You just have to own that. You have to invest in the things that matter most. So that's one day a week. Could, could, you, could you up your game one day a week with your family, with, with a friend? Now, there is a, another challenge, and I'm, I'm going to go extreme here. If the average couple is speaking to one another four minutes a day, here's the seven-day challenge. You can start today on the way home. For the next seven days, I'm going to talk to my husband. I'm going to talk to my wife. I'm going to talk to a kid. I'm going to talk to a friend. I'm going to talk to a parent. I'm going to talk and listen 10 minutes a day. I'm going to invest in communication every day. I mean, Yogi Berra said why this is so important. He said, you can, you can hear an awful lot just by listening. And that's true. But it takes time. It takes time. So the place to start is to value your relationships more. The place to start is not with the assumption that work is non-negotiable. It's, it's to start with the assumption that family is non-negotiable. Isn't that true? Nobody at the end of the life says, oh, I wish I'd spent more time at the office. I wish I'd, I'd spent more time writing reports. I wish I'd spent more time working on the business. But a lot of people say, oh, man, I, I, wish, I'd, I wish I'd spent more time with my kids. I wish we'd taken more trips, spent, taken more walks in the evening. Elevate the importance of your relational life. Elevate the importance of family. This one mind shift will open the door to all kinds of creative possibilities for relational health, for overcoming some of the mistakes, the relation slips of the past, for reducing the threat level in your relational environment. I mean, here it is. Work hard, the Holy Spirit says, to speak to one another, to listen to one another, to understand one another. 
Relationships matter. And relation slips don't have to be fatal if you work to overcome them. Yesterday, I did a funeral for Teresa's great aunt. And the week before, on Saturday, I did a, a funeral for a 40-year-old man who suffered from ALS. Now, both these people had some things in common. Obviously, they both died. But you know what they had in common? The 40-year-old man had ALS, you know, 12, 15 years. At the end of his life, he was totally dependent upon others for his care, for his movement, for his feeding, for everything. But he was asked in the last months of his life, how are you? He said, I'm fine. I'm great in every way that matters. You see, he didn't let his bodily dysfunction determine his happiness level. He was thriving because he was surrounded by relational health a wife and a son who loved him, friends who were investing in him, a caregiver who treated him like a beloved brother. He made everyone who visited him feel better because he invested in them. He didn't cry about his own situation. You know how healthy that is? Now, his body was deceased, and it ultimately cost him an exit from this world. But he's with Jesus now. He's way better off. But what made his life? Relationships made his life. Even his world became smaller, his love became larger. And yesterday, there was a graveside service for Teresa's great aunt, and she was 89 years old. And Teresa, when she was a kid, said, I looked at my great aunt like Doris Day. Some of you are going to say, who's Doris Day? But she was a you know, kind of a glamorous personality, a movie star, a TV star, just always looked nice, always vivacious, always friendly. And Aunt Nedra was kind of that way, always having fun, always smiling, always making people happy. She had lots of relationships that were healthy. Last year of her life, she had dementia, and yet her husband faithfully cared for her every day, along with others. Why? because relationships matter most. Friends, what will you do today to invest in your relational life, especially when it comes to communicating, starting with your family and then with your friends? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we bow down before you today, and we thank you, God, for this challenge to, uh, to communicate better, Lord. And Holy Spirit, I ask you to fill me up and teach me because I need to improve in this, Lord. And I'm thankful that you're not done with me yet, that I am improving. And God, I pray that that be the case for all of us, that we would engage in reliable communication that permits progress. Lord, that we would be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. God, that we would recognize and ruthlessly eliminate the things that we're doing that hurt when we communicate. And Father, that we would work at this every day, that we would own it and pursue it with your help. God, thank you that we are a community of relationships here at River Hills. Please, Lord, help us to connect with you. Help us to connect with one another. In Jesus' name. Now watch this, and it's going to be followed by a baptism. As a child, I was brought up in the church, probably through my teens and early 20s. I got away from God and kind of lived a little bit wild. I've had a rough life and it's, you know, it's been a lot. There's a bit of depression and a little bit of darkness that you just feel inside. I've come to this church on Easter and on Christmases. I've been here now for five weeks in a row. Every time I've left here, I've felt uh, the spirit and, and the joy that it brings. I just wanted my kids to have that. So the moment I decided that this would be a great change for my life and my family's life uh, would be that first Sunday that I came uh, with the music and the worship, all the prayer and the joy that it brought. You just feel it. It's, um, it's something that's just awesome. Despite the weather, all the crazy snow and the condition of the roads, we all felt like a million bucks leaving out of here. I think for a while now, I've had a calling that God's kind of spoke to me 
of magnetic compulsion pulling me towards religion and particularly this church. It's just something that I felt that I've needed for a while. Moving forward, something that I've been wanting to do is bring more people in so that they can feel the joy and the spirit of the Lord. That's what God wants me to do. If you're seeing this and you're on the fence and you think this might be something that you wanna do, all I can say is watch the smile on my face when I come out of that water. That's gonna be awesome. Our friend Andy has a beautiful story. And Andy, I wanna ask you two questions in front of our church. Do you believe Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? I do. And do you believe Jesus Christ died, buried, and resurrected? I do. Awesome, church, can we get a round of applause for that? Amen. Cross your arms. It's an honor and privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ, raised to new life. Woo! Let's go, church. That's what we're talking about. Amen. If you would like to be baptized today, we can make that happen. See one of our pastors in the lobby. See somebody at the Welcome Center. This church is about God and his people. And if you're feeling drawn to baptism today, don't leave here without doing something. Hey, my name is Erin Kahn. I am a volunteer here at River Hills Christian Church. One more time, I'd like to welcome you here today, especially if you're new here. We're delighted by your presence. We invite everybody to scan the QR code you're gonna see pop up behind me. If you're new, you can let us know you are here. If you've been here for a long time, this is actually a new QR code. So this will take you to a different landing page. So we invite everybody, uh, point your phone to that code right now and unlock lots of information about our church. Today, if you came prepared to give as an act of worship, there will be people stationed at the doors with offering bags. You can always give online or at our Welcome Center in the variety of ways you see behind me. One awesome thing about River Hills is that we are a praying church, and we are starting a new initiative. We want people committed to praying for our church every day of the week. So if you would like, pick a day out of the week, whatever day you want, and that will be your day that you just commit to praying for River Hills. There's a table in the lobby, and if you would like, we invite you to stop by, find out more about this prayer thing. But the what, there's no limit to what we can do when we collectively ask God to bless our church, and so many good things are happening here. We want you covered in prayer, the whole community covered in prayer. So see that table in the lobby. Also, there's a table in the lobby if you're interested in just finding out more about what's going on here. We've got men's ministries and women's ministries and kids' ministries, so check out more information before you leave here today. Tonight, if you are interested in becoming part of a small group, we have group link. Coming tonight does not necessarily commit you to signing your life away. It is investigational, but we do hope you get connected with some people and some groups will form out of tonight. So if you've wondered about going deeper, if you're ready to take that next step, please come tonight at 6.30 and be part of group link so that you can potentially get hooked up with a small group and um, good stuff will happen. So, hey, I'm going to pray for us before we go. After the prayer, if you want more prayer, we have people who want to come meet you. Stay where you're sitting. People will come find you, and they would love to pray with you further if there's anything on your heart that you want to lift up uh, with someone else today. All right, let's go to God together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your church at River Hills. Thank you that we get to do life together. Thank you for the goodness that is in your kingdom. Thank you that we can bear one another's burdens. We can spur one another on to love and good deeds. God, this week, I pray that your Holy Spirit would remind us to just be a little better at our relationships. God, however we need prompting, we're just trusting your Holy Spirit will help us take that next step to do the next right thing with the relationships, particularly in our family. God, I pray a blessing on everybody here today. Thank you for the baptism that we had today. God, thank you for all your good gifts. It's in the name of Jesus we pray, and all God's people said. Amen. All right, have a great week. Thanks.